Father, we come before you, Lord, and we thank you again for who you are and what you've done. We thank you for sending your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to be our substitute, to be our Savior. We thank you, Lord, for the gift of eternal life by faith in your Son. We thank you, Lord, for the spiritual life and the Christian way of life. We can run and we can look unto Jesus running this race as we walk by means of the Spirit. Help us to continue to walk by faith and not by sight. And along the way, we know there'll be many trials and tribulations and testings. Help us to endure these with confidence, with rest, faith rest, and help us, Lord, to be further strengthened, strengthened through the teaching of your word. And we ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. If you have your Bibles, let's take a look at the Gospel of John. John chapter 3, verse 25 is where we left off last time. John chapter 3, uh, verse 25. Uh, and in, th in this section of scripture, we have a uh, two competing groups of individuals that are baptizing. Uh, we know that John the Baptist's ministry was to prepare the way for the Messiah. So his baptism ministry prepared the way for the Lord. But there reached a point in, uh, of time in John's life that he accomplished his mission. Things were winding down for John. And then things were picking up for the one he pointed to, the Lord Jesus Christ. So at that point in time, there's a short transition where there are, both, there are two groups of individuals that were both baptizing. There was John the Baptist. He was baptizing north of this area. And then Jesus, who is baptizing closer to the land of Israel. I think I said it the opposite way last week. So uh, we have here... The uh, John the Baptist, the, he was baptizing further north, and Jesus was baptizing further south. Now, instead of competition, uh, both ministries certainly complemented each other. What John did was not uh, taking away from what the disciples were doing under the authority of Jesus. Now, it says that Jesus' disciples uh, were baptizing, or Jesus was baptizing, although that meant under the authority of Jesus as we see in chapter four, verse one. And then this issue arose between some of John's disciples, seeing that this competition's going on and the question of baptism and what was going on, they had some issues about ritual purification. Now keep in mind, this arises out of an Old, uh, Old Testament understanding of a ceremony, a ritual of cleansing, so that the individuals can be pure. Maybe the meaning of the baptisms was an issue, but I think it also reached into the idea of competing ministries or competing baptisms. And later on, John clarified to his disciples, he said, he must increase, meaning the Messiah, and I must decrease. Meaning that there's no competition. What you have is a gift of God. God gives you a specific ministry, and if someone else is, uh, has a larger following, a larger crowd, as long as you're doing what God has called you to do, you have faithfully followed God's will. And so we can learn a lot of lessons from this scripture about uh, how individuals and ministries try to compete, and there really is no competition if we're all on the same side. So we have here the issue that arose on baptism or purification. Now, we're going to study the doctrine of baptism this morning. We may continue on next week. There's a lot of doctrine concerning the doctrine of baptism. We're going to try to classify and distinguish various baptisms in the Bible. But basically, the idea of baptism means identification. We also have the concept of dipping or immersing. So both of those concepts, the idea of identification and the ritual of immersing, dipping, placing, we could say, uh, the basic root concept of bapti baptizing. So baptism speaks of identification. Uh, Jewish proselyte baptism, which was practiced in Christ's time, meant the identification of Gentile proselytes with Judaism. Baptism in the mystery religions had the same significance. John's baptism identified the people with his message, the message of a coming Messiah. Likewise, Christian baptism was identification with Christian message and with the Christian group. 
So those are very distinct baptisms. Now let's take a look here at this map, and we're going to zoom in on this area here. Oh, I'm sorry. Wow, <laughs> that helps. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. That's a lot better. Thank you. Um, so we have here this map of the baptismal site of John the Baptist, and this is Salim and Anon. So Anon was near Salim, and therefore we see the Jordan River. This is further north as we see the Sea of Galilee. We have what's called the Rift Valley, the Jordan River Valley, uh, in which the Jordan River ran. And this area ran from the Sea of Galilee. The Jordan River flowed all the way down to the area of the Dead Sea. So along that way, there were certain sections which would have water and certain areas which would be conducive to baptize. And therefore, John started out in this region, by the way, north of the Dead Sea, uh, this is usually located, the traditional location just north of the Dead Sea, this area where John baptized Jesus. And we're going to get into why was Jesus baptized. It's one of the things we need to look at. Um, and then, of course, Jesus flees uh, after that baptism in Matthew chapter 4. Uh, John, John's baptism of Jesus, Matthew 3, Matthew 4, Jesus is driven by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted 40 days. And normally this is called the Judean wilderness, which was here alongside the Dead Sea, a desolate region where Jesus faced down Satan and he was tempted of Jesus. But the baptism ministry of Jesus and his disciples, or John the Baptist, uh, was north here. And this area, which is a central point of Gentile regions, the area of Anon and Salim. And the Decapolis region is the area. Now, the reason for this relocation of John the Baptist's ministry is given in the text. There's much water there. Uh, so John the Baptist moved into an area further north where there was more water available. Now, some speculate that he could have been reaching out to Gentiles at this point. I'm not sure about that, even though he's in Gentile territory. Uh, Jesus later said, do not go to, to the, only go initially to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Um, but uh, anyway, he's up in Gentile territory. So he's up in the area here, the cross section of the Gentiles and the Roman region of Decapolis and then later Samaria. And this is right before Jesus eventually moves north. So afterwards, we'll see in John chapter four, Jesus, because of pressure, from the Pharisees in increasing opposition, relocates and decides to go into Gentile territory and witness to a Gentile woman, the woman at Sinkar. Now you see the well of Sinkar here. We have Sinkar here in the region of Samaria. So Jesus witnesses to the Samaritan woman in John chapter four. So we're looking at this transition here, moving toward the Gentiles we see early on in the Gospel of John. Of course, the Gospel goes out to all. Uh, and even the outline of the book of Acts begin at Jerusalem and go into uh, Judea and then Samaria. Remember Philip in Acts chapter 8 goes to the Samaritans. Jesus paved the way for that. John the Baptist, by the way, I think paved the way in one sense. He's up in that region at least. Uh, and then Jesus later meeting the Samaritan woman and then later Philip reaching uh, the Samaritans. It was a great revival in Acts chapter 8 under Philip's ministry. So the gospel's gospel here initially uh, is going out, but initially Jesus is here down in this region. So he is in the same region, area, I believe, where he was baptized. So um, he remains in that region, and then because of pressure, eventually moves up into the region of Samaria in uh, John chapter 4. I have another map of this various region, and I'll zoom in on this. Um, so we have this term Bethany beyond the Jordan early on mentioned of Jesus' baptismal site, and most scholars place it in this region in the area of Perea, just near the region of Judea. You have Jerusalem here, 
Jericho here and this area of Bethany beyond the Jordan. Now, there's another possible location of that near the Sea of Galilee up in the further north, but I hold to the opinion that this makes better sense down in this region, closer to the area of Judea, where Jesus was baptized. Um, and then John the Baptist later on was in prison in a very, it's interesting, Herod built these elaborate buildings. One of the areas he built is Machaerus, and John the Baptist was in prison in this area, which is traditionally in the area of a, a Gentile area. Remember the land of Moab, the Moabites uh, historically lived in that area on the other side of the Dead Sea region. And then John eventually, tradition is executed uh, in this area at, at the, where he's held a prisoner by Herod in Matthew 14, verses one through 12. And then we have, again, back to the same area, the area of Decapolis. Notice this green region. This whole area was the area of Decapolis. You know, think about uh, Decapolis, uh, meaning 10. So there was 10 Greek cities that were prominent in that region. And so this is the region of Decapolis. Um, and then the region of Samaria too. Certainly near Gentile territory is where John the Baptist was at this time. So two competing ministries in one sense, but really they're not in competition. And I think that issue is settled. Now, what is the purpose of those various baptism ministries? Well, we're going to look at, before we look at that, we're going to, we're going to discuss two types of baptisms in the Bible. Two types, major types. And I, I, I simplified it into dry and wet. <laughs> really easy. There are dry baptisms where the individual never gets wet. <laughs> Not one drop of water. And then there are wet baptisms where water is used. So dry baptisms and wet baptisms. Now, if you look in your systematic theology under Chafer, I think he classifies it into real and ritual. Real and ritual. Now, I hesitate to say that even the wet baptisms are real baptisms. So I kind of shy away from that terminology using real and ritual, but that's one way to classify it. But I like dry and wet. <laughs> dry and wet because most people think the first thing they think about baptism is water right going into the water you know uh, and therefore they don't realize that there are many things that are called baptisms that don't involve water and we're going to look at those first and I have four four dry baptisms number one obviously the major and we'll spend most of the time on this one because this involves you as a born-again believer in the church age. When you believe the gospel, the Holy Spirit places you into union with Christ, and this is called spirit baptism. It is not a feeling. People get this eye because of Pentecostalism and the Charismatics. When we hear spirit baptism, we think about someone being knocked over in some evangelistic service, uh, <laughs> slaying the spirit, someone speaking in tongues, you know, and all this stuff that's supposed to be spirit baptism. That's not what the Bible teaches. Now, there was tongues phenomena in the book of Acts. Uh, there were certain manifestations of the spirit, but keep in mind, the book of Acts was a transitional period and uh, what God was doing early on under apostolic authority. We still have apostles who were perform <laughs> performing sign gifts to authenticate the messenger and the message. So we have authenticating signs early on in Acts that would eventually transition out once the completion of the word of God came. And uh, you can reference 1 Corinthians 13, verse 8. Tongues will cease. And that's not the rapture either. <laughs> it, it, it will cease at the completion of the canon of Scripture, the word of God. So the period of time when the tongues would cease or stop altogether, before the completion of Scripture, I would say, and prophecy and knowledge would stop altogether. There's a difference in there in the vocabulary or grammar in 1 Corinthians 13. So when John wrote the book of Revelation, the last prophetic word of the Bible, we have what's called the close of the canon. There are no additional books of the 66 books of the Bible that we have that are authorized by God. The word of God is complete at that time and no further 
prophetic or pro uh, prophecy and so forth as far as revelation. I'm not talking about Bible prophecy. I'm talking about revelation from God, direct revelation from God. We have now the written word of God that we interpret and study. So we have the idea of spirit baptism. So don't get the charismatic idea of a feeling, some kind of power knocking you over, um, some kind of thing that you do after salvation. This occurs when you believe, and it's not felt at all because it occurs that fast. When you believe the gospel, boom, you're placed into Christ. And it's not a feeling. And it's a, it's a reality uh, revealed that we receive by faith because of the word of God. You are now in an inalterable position. If you're familiar with the top circle, bottom circle analogy, you're placed into that top circle. You're in union with Christ forever. And I think I have that, that diagram here later. So this prophesied baptism that Christ would perform spiritually is prophesied in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. It is prophesied, actually, actually, Matthew, Mark, Luke. John does mention it later, but under a different term in John 14. So Matthew, Mark, Luke, it's near in Acts 1.5. He says, you'll be baptized not many days from here, and it's only 10 days from Pentecost. Acts chapter 11 looks back on the experience of what the Jews experienced in Acts chapter 2, that God gave to Cornelius a light gift. And so we can point out Acts chapter 2 as the first time when this occurred. Now, not the language when you're reading Acts chapter 2 is tied into spirit baptism. You have the filling ministry of the Holy Spirit in Acts 2.4, which is not to be confused with spirit baptism. So when you read Acts, we know it occurred because of the prophecy in Acts 5, and they reference in Acts 11, referring back to Acts 2. And it was a, a transaction placing these new believers, or these people that were unsaved that now are believers, into the body of Christ. Now they are part of the body of Christ. The church begins. And so the baptism ministry of the Holy Spirit is a ministry that makes a believer part of the universal body of Christ called the church. Now, in the doctrine of ecclesiology, the church consists of a universal body. All believers are part of the universal church. But yet all believers have the necessity of being part of a local church. And there are 23 local churches that are addressed in the New Testament. Church at Ephesus, church at Smyrna. Uh, you see seven churches that are addressed in Revelation 2 and 3. Very important for your spiritual maturity and growth that you're part of a local church that teaches accurate doctrine under a sound pastor teacher, Ephesians 4. That's the goal and should be purpose of every believer. Even missionaries should be tied into a local church. They are sent forth. The missionaries were sent forth from the church at Jerusalem. So even missionaries are not out there on their own in the sense they go out under the authority of the, the local church. They're tied in, and even the Apostle Paul reported back uh, to the local church at Antioch after his missionary journey. He gave a report to that church of his missionary endeavors. And we sometimes hear about missionaries who come and visit and give reports of their activity. So being part of the local church is very important, but it's the spirit that baptizes you into the universal church, the body of Christ. Um, and then it's doctrinally explained in Ephesians 4, 5, Romans 6, 3, and 4, Galatians 3, 27, 28, Colossians 2, 9 through 12, and 1 Peter 3, 18 through 21. So if you think of it this way, it's prophesied in the Gospels, it's revealed in the book of Acts, and it's doctrinally explained in the epistles and later writings of Peter. So the letters, it's explained what this is. Uh, that's a simple way of understanding the, the spirit baptism. Now, if you follow us several years ago when we went over the 50 things that God has given to us at the moment of faith alone in Christ alone, we mentioned four permanent ministries of the Holy Spirit for the believer. So when you believe, here's ribs, you are regenerated, which speaks of the new birth, 
what Jesus told Nicodemus, you must be born again, John 3, 3. And what is regeneration? Definition, the impartation of eternal life. When God gives you eternal life, you have experienced a new birth. The impartation of eternal life. The I is the indwelled. The Spirit of God indwells you permanently. The Spirit of God doesn't leave. He can be grieved. He, he can be quenched. He, but he abides with you forever. He indwells you. Baptism. This is what we're discussing here. The believer being put or placed into the body of Christ. You're put or play the act of placing you into the body of Christ, that spirit baptism. S, the spirit that indwells you now seals you. In Ephesians 1, 13 and 14. He seals you, securing your salvation until your redemption, the rapture, redemption of your bodies. You're signed, sealed, and delivered as a born-again believer. Your name's written in heaven. You're sealed by the Holy Spirit of God. When the rapture occurs, you'll be delivered to the one who sealed you. And so those are the four permanent ministries that God has given to us. Now, the baptism ministry of the Holy Spirit, The oh, these are graphically uh, portrayed. I did this a few years ago, uh, showing the various ministries of the Spirit and how they're graphically portrayed. So when we look at the being in Christ, we are baptized by the Spirit into the body of Christ. And I'll have that Spirit baptism picture the act of the believer being placed in that top circle. Now you're connected to Christ. We call that union. You're united to Christ. When Paul uses that phrase, in Christ, over and over, in Christ, in Christ, he speaks of your connectedness. You're in union with Christ. So it's the ministry of the Holy Spirit that takes you and places you, you can say baptizes, places you into Christ, connects you to Christ in union. Now, the indwelling spirits, the Spirit of God, abides in me. He remains. And then the sealing's ongoing because that ministry is constant. The Spirit himself, who lives in me, guarantees my future redemption till he redeems the body that he sealed. And that occurs at the rapture. So the sealing ministry is a constant, ongoing. It's not felt. It's just spirits there. He seals you. He makes sure that you safely arrive in heaven. So that speaks of eternal security, by the way. All of these really, really speak of a security in Christ. Spirit abides forever. And then this is the ministry that deals with spiritual living. The filling, don't confuse the filling and the baptism. The filling ministry of the Holy Spirit is the Spirit's control of the born-again believer, Ephesians 5.18. Be not drunk with wine, which is dissipation, but be filled. The idea of being filled with the Spirit is to be controlled by the Spirit, an ongoing, present tense. Be continually filled with the Spirit. It's passive because it's God who does the filling. When I'm walking in fellowship with God, when I confess not sins that are known, and I am at that point controlled by the Spirit of God. When I personally sin, I no longer am in fellowship. That's why 1 John 1, 9 comes into play. When I sin, I'm outside of fellowship. I'm not outside of my union with Christ. I'm, not out, I'm still in Christ. As a carnal Christian, I'm in Christ. But I'm not walking in fellowship. And that simple distinction, by the way, clears up so much doctrine. So much doctrine to know my position, permanent, constant, in my daily walk, that can be on or off. <laughs> uh, you have good days and you have bad days, spiritually speaking as well. <laughs> uh, you, have, you have days when you're out of fellowship, and so you need to come back to terms with your sin. So when I acknowledge my sin, the filling ministry of the Holy Spirit is restored at that point. And now I'm trucking along again. I'm walking back. I'm back in fellowship, and then I can continue to walk by faith and live the Christian life. So that's the relationship there. Regeneration, by the way, again, a one-time event. That's why I put it down in this line, because to be born again, your physical birth occurred at a point in time. Therefore, your spiritual birth occurs at a point in time. Now, whether you remember your spiritual birthday or not, if you believe the gospel today, you're born again. I don't remember when I came out of my mother's womb. 
I'm only told that I was born on April 18, 1964. I know that because that's what my mom told me. <laughs> and that's what's on my birth certificate. I think I maybe one time saw my birth certificate, but I take the word of my parents. That's when you were born. But certainly you can know you're born again by believing the promises of God, believing God's word. And therefore you can have that assurance the moment you believe. Now, defining baptism, that bapti baptizing work of the Spirit, is that work whereby the Spirit places the believer into union with Christ. That's the definition here. I should say spirit baptism. That work whereby the Spirit places a believer into union with Christ. Let's take a look at the main doctrinal passage, 1 Corinthians 12, 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13. Paul says, for by one spirit, we were all baptized into one body, okay? So the spirit is the means whereby we are placed into the body of Christ, right there. And he says, all of us are baptized. By the way, baptism in here, this word is an aorist tense verb, <laughs> baptizo meaning it occurred at a specific point in time. Uh, the Spirit of God places us into the body of Christ at a particular period of time, point in time. And notice he says all the believers in Corinth, now they were not living godly life, a godly life, but they were all placed into the body of Christ, having believed the gospel. And God makes us a member of the body of Christ in verse 18, now God has set the members, each one of them, in the body. Notice, in the body, just as he pleases. So we're all baptized, all baptized, and I mentioned this before, go down to the end. He mentions various temporal spiritual gifts, and a couple are permanent. Uh, permanent ones are in the green, verse 28, teaching, helps, and administration. The others, such as miracles, apostles, those are temporal. But he asked a question, you know, since we're all in the body, we all different have, body has different functions, different purposes. Each body part's different, but the body is function to work together. It was designed that way. Now, therefore, do everyone, does everyone have the gift of apostle? No. The gift of prophet? No. The gift of teaching? Now, the question is, verse 29, are all apostles the obvious answer is no. Are all prophets? No. Are all teachers? No. Not everyone has the gift of teaching. Um, therefore, there are various different gifts, including the temporal gift at that time. Question is, do all speak with tongues? Which is very interesting. And the charismatics add, well, God wants everyone to speak in tongues, and they didn't speak in tongues because they were not spiritual. Wrong explanation. If you look at the other gifts or all apostles and prophets, that wasn't because they didn't seek those gifts or whatever. It's because God did not give them those gifts. Make that distinction. So the mandate that everyone has to speak in tongues to be spiritual, well then, these Corinthians can never be spiritual. You know, I have to speak in tongues to be a spiritual person. I have to have the baptism of the Holy Spirit to be spiritual. This is false. This is what's being taught. Our, the baptism ministry of the Holy Spirit is accompanied by speaking in tongues. You want to show other people that you receive the baptism ministry of the Holy Spirit, then you will manifest and speak forth in tongues. Well, how come you have the question, this quote, all are baptized, but all do not speak in tongues? See? Con connect that together. So it shows you that the baptism ministry of the Holy Spirit is not evident by speaking in tongues. Now, we do have certain transitional issues in the book of Acts where tongues are spoken, and those were learned languages. It was never gibberish. Tongues, glossia, was a language that, you, that was unlearned by the speaker. And we see that in Acts 2. They each heard the word of God in their own dialect. That was the miracle of Pentecost. It wasn't speaking blah, 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 blah. Um, 
So the gift of tongues, uh, you know, today, that one fact alone is never gibberish, always speaking in a known human language. That would destroy the charismatic movement by itself. That would falsify so many false expressions of the gift of tongues today. It's not, it's, we go with the authority of the word of God. Um, but the point is that all bat are baptized, but all do not speak in tongues. Now, um, let's go back here to uh, our, our, our uh, verses on the, dry, the spirit baptism. Let's begin in Matthew chapter three. So we're gonna look at where Jesus prophesied of this coming ministry, Matthew 3.11. Uh, John the Baptist here, uh, in speaking, and then Jesus comes along. Uh, let's take a look at um, here. Notice here, John's prophesying of this coming ministry, John the Baptist. He said in verse 11, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, that's John's ministry, for the nation of Israel. But he who is coming after me, that would be the Messiah, is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry, the Messiah, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. By the way, we have three separate baptisms that are distinct in this passage, distinct baptisms. John's baptism for the nation of Israel to prepare them for the coming Messiah. We have the future baptism of the Holy Spirit in which would inaugurate the church age. And then we have the Baptism by fire, and we'll see that later, that will occur at the second coming of Christ. It's a judgment. Fire baptism is a judgment. <clears throat> three separate baptisms and three separate times. One before Pentecost, one at Pentecost, and the other far future still yet at the second coming of Christ, the baptism by fire as judgment. Three separate baptisms. Okay. We know the fire baptism, I'm getting ahead of myself, that's okay, but we know, I'll repeat it, repetition is good, but the fire baptism in the context is defined in verse 12. What is the fire baptism? His winnowing fan is in his hand, remember? What do you do with the winnowing fan? You separate wheat and chaff, and we'll see how later the separation of the wheat and tares occurs at the end in uh, Matthew 13. And he will thoroughly cleanse out his threshing floor, gather his wheat into the barn. The barn, the analogy of the kingdom. Uh, the believers will go into the kingdom. But what will he do with the chaff? He will burn up the chaff with what? Unquenchable fire. So notice fire in the context. Fire in the context here speaks of the uh, fire of judgment. Now let's go back here to uh, Matthew Matthew 3, verse 11. So here, the unquenchable fire is connected to the fire baptism. See that? That's judgment. Judgment there. Every time you look at the word fire, you have to always examine its context. Sometimes fire can refer to cleansing. Sometimes it refers to God judging our works at the judgment seat of Christ, not going to hell. So fire does not necessarily mean hell all the time, but it can have a connotation certainly here. Uh, he will burn the chaff with unquenchable fire. So that's the fire baptism. All right, let's, let's go back to then our PowerPoint. So we have Mark 1.8, Luke 3.16 predicting, in essence, the same thing. So those parallel gospel accounts predict of the coming spirit baptism. It's still future from that perspective. It hasn't occurred yet. John's baptizing in water, that is occurring, but the Messiah would do what when he comes? Would eventually baptize by the Spirit. Now, the question is, let's take a look at John 14. John 14, 16 and 17, the term is not used, uh, baptize, but the concept is. So we have the concept of Spirit baptism in here. Uh, Jesus talks to his disciples right before his crucifixion. He says in the upper room, I pray the Father and he will give you another helper. 
Another helper would be a paraclete. By the way, the Greek word for another is another of the same kind. I think it's where, yeah, alos, A-L-L-O-S. Whereas the other Greek word would be heteros, another of a different kind. Paul spoke about a gospel that was another but not another. He uses two different Greek words there, by the way, Galatians 1. Here, he's saying he's going to give you another helper, another comforter like himself, which shows that Christ is a paraclete. Christ is a comforter, one who comes alongside to aid or assist. He's going to bring another one, and that would be the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit would do what? Here's indwelling, abide with you forever. That's indwelling. When Pentecost occurs, every believer would have the indwelling spirit permanently. He's called the spirit of truth. Notice the various names of the Holy Spirit here. The spirit of truth. God's nature is a God of truth. So this is an attribute of God. He is deity. Whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him for he dwells with you and will be in you. Notice that. He dwells with you, but will be in you. The Spirit of God had dwelt with the disciples in the person Jesus. Now he would dwell in them. The Spirit of God would dwell in them. Now, later in this text, he speaks of another ministry, the Spirit of God. In verse 10, at that day you will know that I am in the Father, and you in me. Notice that phrase, you in me. That's in union with Christ. At that day. So this is yet future. And then I and you. We call that reciprocal placement. You're going to be in me. I'm going to be in you. You and me would be the believer placed in union with Christ. <laughs> and who would do that? The Spirit of God is the agent used to place the believer into the body of Christ. You and me. So I think that is a subtle way to refer to the baptism ministry of the Holy Spirit. All right, let's take a look, take a look at Acts 1, 5. Acts chapter 1, verse 5. So we fast forward right before Christ's ascension. He reminds, he's been with his disciples 40 days, and he reminds them of this promise that he mentioned earlier, uh, John the Baptist alluded to, he said, John truly baptized with water. That's one that's called a wet baptism. Okay? But you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. That's called a dry baptism. <laughs> so he had two distinct baptisms. The wet one by John, and that was for the nation of Israel. And not all wet baptisms are alike. Okay? Not all wet baptisms have the same purpose. Um... Just like dry baptism, our dry baptisms are distinct as well. You will be baptized with the Holy Spirit when? Not many days from now. Well, 10 days later, we have the day of Pentecost, don't we? So it's close, not many days from now. So they're 10 days out from Pentecost. And when we look at Acts chapter 11, verse 15, we have the clue of what occurred at Pentecost was the giving of the Spirit of God and incorporating these believers into the body of Christ. Now let's take a look at Acts, let's see there. Acts chapter 11, verse 15. Acts 11, 15 through 17. Um, Cornelius is about to be addressed, or Cornelius was being addressed here. Peter is sent, he's at Joppa, and he's uh, he will... Uh, give the Holy, he will pre present the gospel. And when he was doing that, notice verse 15, as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell upon them as on us at the beginning. What does he mean that, by that? Peter was where at the beginning? The beginning of what? The church. This gives you a clue when the church began. Beginning of what? Uh, when did the Spirit fall upon Peter? Beginning of the church. Um, now, Notice here another observation about this. Even though the Spirit's ministry was delayed at points in the book of Acts for a specific historical purpose, uh, the apostles had to, they had to, those in Samaria had to wait for the apostles to come 
lay hands on them so that the spirit would come. That was not the norm. That was to tie them to the Jerusalem church so that there would not be a split church at the beginning. They had to wait for apostolic authority to come saying, you guys, you Samaritans are on the same plane as we are, believers in Christ. And there's a reason why that delay of giving the Spirit of God. Historically, we see several reasons why the Spirit was delayed. But when he pre Peter preaches to a Gentile, while he's speaking, the Spirit comes. No laying on of hands, nothing. He comes immediately. And by the way, they didn't tarry for the Spirit. They didn't pray for the Spirit. They believed the gospel. And what happened? The Spirit came. Very important. This is the norm to the Gentile, first Gentile convert. Then I remember the word of the Lord. Now he recalls what's occurring here, how John indeed baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So what occurred to them, the whole gift of the Spirit, by the way, that includes baptism, occurred there with Cornelius. They were part now of the body of Christ. So he's pointing back to the arrival of the Spirit, where? At Pentecost, at the beginning. He's connecting that to that event. So therefore, verse 17 says, that therefore God gave them the same gift as he gave us when we believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. Who was I that I could withstand God? Think about that. So that points back to when that baptism occurred. A very important clue. Now, this baptism is described, as we saw in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, the Spirit incorporates you into the body of Christ, giving you a permanent position. Ephesians 4, 5 is simply a short verse mentioning the Spirit's baptism, but I want you to observe the context. Very important observation here. We have a seven things that are one. Seven things, the number of perfection, by the way, the word seven used, over and over in the book of Revelation, by the way. And that's why Chafer loved the number seven. <laughs> Chafer always mentions seven things. Uh, even if we can't, we don't have, we have six, we're still going to try to make seven. <laughs> so I have the number seven. But here we do have seven things, including one Lord, and this speaks of one, by the way, is the word one, the number for unity. One Lord, one faith, that's, scripture that's revealed, and then one baptism. Now, there's a lot of doctrinal dispute on this. What do you mean one baptism? Aren't we supposed to be baptized by water? And this, if it's spirit baptism, is it either or? What is it? I think the context gives us the clue. He's indicating that there's one spirit baptism, not two spirit baptisms. He didn't exclude water baptism at this point. He's saying that there is one baptism because this makes us part of the body. Remember 1 Corinthians 12. By the way, you can parallel 1 Corinthians 12 and following with this passage. Similar terms, baptism, body, spirit, identical language. So parallel passage, 1 Corinthians 12. There is one body and what? One spirit. As you recall, one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. So the body, the spirit, and one baptism. What baptism is he referring to? Not H2O. He's referring to spirit baptism that makes us part of what? The body of Christ. Because there's one body, not two bodies, there are not two separate spirit baptisms. I think the context would argue for that. So this tells us that this makes us part of the body of Christ in agreement 1 Corinthians 12. Now, Romans chapter 6, verse 3 and 4. Romans 6, verses 3 and 4. Do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus, and again, were placed into union with Christ, we were baptized into his death. Now, this means that we were identified with Christ in his death. And again, he judged the old sin nature. We were identified in his death, buried with him, notice there, um, so that we were raised with him. 
uh, notice, so that we should walk in newness of life. He judges sin nature so that we can live a godly life. But we were identified with Christ and his death, burial, and resurrection. And this is our, our picture of our union with Christ. So in Christ, uh, we realize that the sin nature has been judged, and now we're identified with Christ and his death, burial, and resurrection. And now we can live the Christian life by walking by means of the Spirit. But the baptism, ministry of the Holy Spirit, is not progressive sanctification. All right, I have to explain that. The baptism ministry of the Holy Spirit sets us up for progressive sanctification. Okay? So baptism just occurs one time. We're in union with Christ. But because of our identity in Christ, we can reckon upon the judgment of the sin nature. We can now appropriate God's resources and walk in light of who we are. All right? So the baptism ministry of the Holy Spirit is not how we live the Christian life. We already have it. The filling ministry of the Holy Spirit is how we live the Christian life. The control of the Spirit. So don't confuse the baptism with the filling. Uh, but this is another piece of the puzzle telling us that because of our identity in Christ, he judged the sin nature uh, when, we were, when we were connected to him. Well, actually, when he, when he died, then we can reckon ourselves to be dead indeed in the sin alive unto God. Now, let's take a look at Galatians 3, 27, 28. Galatians 3. We call this co-crucifixion, by the way. For as many as you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. And explains this in verse 28. This is union. There's neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither slave nor free. There's neither male nor female. Now, you have individuals who say that women should be pastors and they love this verse. There's neither female, male nor female. What is he saying here? Are there not different positions that God has assigned? Some pastor, teacher, male only. That doesn't mean that God does not have ministries for women. They cannot do, function in a spiritual gift, but they're excluded from being a pastor. Um, he's talking about the context of our identity in Christ. If you're a female and you believe the gospel, you are as in much in union with Christ as I am. You have an inalterable position. You have been united to Christ. You have perfect righteousness just as much as I do. If you're a slave, if you're free in those days, on the social rung, ladder, distinct, but yet you're in Christ. See? See, if you say there's neither male nor female trying to argue from that perspective that God has obliterated all distinctions, then we would say, is, is a slave person and a free person distinct socially? Absolutely. What about a Greek and a Gentile? Aren't they distinct as well? See, you can't also, you cannot use this verse for transgenderism either. People who are neither male nor female. It didn't say you're neither. It said, in Christ, you are on an equal footing with men. So this is our position salvifically. Understand that. Not functional. Okay? There's a difference between positions that are functional, and this is our position as far as our identity. So read the whole verse. So we have we have that where those who are us are baptized into Christ, uh, we means that we are equal in the body of Christ. All right. Let's take a look at uh, Colossians. Let's see, did we look at the uh, Colossians yet? Yeah, Colossians chapter 2, verses 9 through 12. Colossians 2. Now, uh, here speaks of the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ in verse 9. In him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Godhead bodily, bodily refers to the fact that Jesus Christ is God and man. So he has all the essence and qualities of God and body. He is the God-man. And by the way, where, how are you related to him? Well, if you're spiritually connected to him, you're complete in him. In him, union with Christ. You're complete in him. And the idea is, in order to be sanctified, you need X, Y, and Z. You need to 
treat yourself harshly. You need to add more rules in your life. You need to do all these other things. Legalism, asceticism, hyper-spirituality, all the false ways of how to be spiritual and excludes our identity in Christ. That's the fact you need to think about. Before you begin living the Christian life, you need to know your identity. And religious legalism does not focus on identity. It focuses on performance. And you don't quite live up to X, Y, and Z. Paul says, by the way, hey, you're complete in him. And he's going to address these false views of you're not complete in Christ. And even those who say, we need to add the baptism and the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit to be spiritual. Wait a second, we're already complete in him. We're already complete in Christ. So it has practical application, certainly, this truth of baptism. Now, let's take a look at 1 Peter 3, 18 through 21. 1 Peter 3, 18 through 21. For Christ also suffered once for sin. Notice this one time, just like the book of Hebrews, by the way. I think this is the word, yeah, hapax. One time for sin as a substitute. I think we had the word hooper, no, Perry, concerning sin. Christ suffered one time concerning sin. The just for the unjust. There's hooper, substitution. Christ died as our substitute that he might bring us to God being put to death in his body, but made alive by the Spirit. And notice Spirit here is capitalized, Holy Spirit. But here it's by whom he went and preached to the spirits in prison. The word pneuma is used differently here. In the same context, we had this word Spirit used distinctly. Now this could refer to the human spirit of Christ. It's capitalized here, referring to the Holy Spirit. But the spirits here are angels. He preached to angels who sinned. And now we're going to get into the uh, Nephilim and, and all that in Genesis 6, but that's what he's referring to. These individuals who took on human form, uh, cohabited with women, uh, did so during Noah's flood. They were disobedient uh, and when the ark was being prepared, Genesis 6, in which a few of that is eight souls were saved through water. Now, when you look at that, what kind of salvation is he talking about? Well, they were saved certainly physically. They were saved not in water. Did they get wet? <laughs> no. No, they didn't. Which is interesting. Who got wet in Noah's flood? The unsaved? <laughs> the unsaved. Notice verse 21. This is also an antitype. That's the fulfillment of the type, which now saves us. Baptism. You say, well, in order to be saved, I need to be baptized by water. Hold the phone. What kind of baptism is he referring to here? Water or spirit? Spirit. Spirit. Meryl Unger argues for this, by the way, in this book. He has a whole book on baptism, ministry of the Holy Spirit. And he does so, argues this is not water baptism. Water baptism does not save us. As a matter of fact, the next phrase tells us that so much. Not the removal of the filth of the flesh. It's not any ceremony dealing with water. But the answer of a good conscience toward God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's a faith issue in the gospel that places us in union with Christ. And by the way, Noah was safe where? In the ark, in that position. And that pictures our union with Christ. We are safe in union with Christ. That's the antitype. Even through the water, not by the water. They were dry in the ark. <laughs> so you can't argue that this is water baptism to make the analogy fit. The unsaved people, they got all wet. This is a dry baptism. A dry baptism. All right, let's sum this up and then we'll, um, we'll partake of communion. So I want to look at... Um, couple things here. So the result of spirit baptism is our union with Christ. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, the spirit baptism judges the sin nature. Uh, it gives us perfect righteousness, the result. And we can add a lot of other things or the things we have in Christ Jesus. 
So when we looked at this, we see clearly, this is a chart by Ryrie, that the baptism ministry was predicted in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, fulfilled on the day of Pentecost, Acts chapter 1, not many days hence. Acts 11, looking back to where? Acts 2, when it first began. That's when the church began. And then explained by Paul in 1 Corinthians 12, 13. So the disciples were first baptized in the Christ's body, Acts 2. The church is Christ's body, Ephesians 1, 21, 22. Therefore the church began in Acts 2 at the beginning. Acts eleven fifteen. 15. So we can argue when the church began at that point through the ministry of the baptism ministry of the Holy Spirit. I think we'll save this for later. We'll continue on this uh, next time. Let's bow our heads and we'll prepare at the same time for communion. So we want to partake of the Lord's Supper. So let's uh, transition into that. And we want to have a time of quiet reflection, quiet reflection when we think about our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, let's...